Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. Y'all, Jimmy, the Chaos Goblin strikes again. I should have known better than to mention I was working on my DC Universe meets Ravenloft hybrid D&D campaign on social media. My bad. He goes and tags a bunch of comics creators we know, and now I have to get it in gear and whip this campaign into shape so we can start playing. Another friend chimes in, are you going to make maps? It's fair to say it's been a while since I put something together, so I guess, question mark? It was then that I discovered Arkham Forge. If you don't know who Arkham Forge is, they have everything you need to make your TTRPG more fun and immersive, allowing you to build, play, and export animated maps, including in-person fog of war capability that lets your players interact with maps as the adventure unfolds while you, the DM, get the full picture. Now I'm set to easily build high-res animated maps, saving myself precious time and significantly adding nuance to our campaign. That's a win every day in my book. Check them out at arkanforge.com and use the discount code YETI5 to get $5 off. I'll drop a link in the show notes for you. And big thanks to Arkan Forge for partnering with our show. I think I'm going to make Jimmy play a Goblin Warlock just to get even. Hello and welcome to Comic Book Yeti's Cryptid Creator Corner. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Gasparro, and I have a fantastic episode uh, that we are going to get into today. I have uh, artist uh, Dan Panosian and writer Scott Snyder. Um, Super excited to have both of these fine gentlemen and comic creators on the podcast today. We're going to talk about Dark Horse's Canary. Um, It is a Western horror uh, I absolutely loved it. The trade is coming out, I think, June 26th, and uh, they're both here, so we can kind of dig into Canary, how the two of them work together, and um, you know whatever else they have coming out, and uh, any other fun comic topics we we find along the way. So, uh, Dan, Scott, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah. For us. Thanks so much for having us. us. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, I was very excited to talk uh, to both of you. Um, uh, you know. Goes without saying, I I only I think I only have this podcast to just talk to folks who make comics that I like. So that's like the the I think the only my uh, the only like ground floor of this podcast was just to talk to people who make comics I like. And uh, so I'm very excited to have the two of you on here and um, in particular to talk about Canary. I'm a huge fan of Westerns and to have like a Western horror, which I just don't think we see too much, uh, even in, you know, in comics. There's probably some films out there that that do it but other than like some issues of jonah hex and i'm sure there's a few others i'm I'm forgetting but this was like a true kind of western horror like genre mixing you know um maybe some some like eldritch type of arcane stuff as well and i i really love the mashup like yeah give me more of it um kind of scott i'll start with you in in terms of was this was there some particular like impetus that you're like, Oh, I want to, I want to tackle this now. Cause this was initially a comicsology original and this was kind of like your second wave of, of, of books there. Yeah. Well, it, it was, um, thanks for asking. I mean, it was actually, it was like, um, part of the, the, the first sort of, um, slate of books that we were doing with them. So it, it, um, came out, I think it was like the, maybe the fifth in the, line but it was um it was part of that kind of initial wave that we um that we pitched to them when we first went over and uh i think yeah i mean i i love western as a genre i mean i've i've gotten to sort of play with it before but i wanted to do one that felt like it was really sort of taking the genre somewhere i hadn't um i hadn't really tried and dan you know i was a fan of his work forever and we had you know, known each other like in passing at cons and had become friendly. And I just, with these books, with comicsology and dark horse, the idea wasn't to have an idea, you know, have a, have a pitch and sort of write it up and go to different artists. The idea was that to have sort of a really nascent idea. Like, I think I want to do something that, that um, is about like this premise, you know, that, that keeps haunting me or something. And then bring that to um, a co-creator um, and have them build it with you in a way or, or talk it through and build something that felt really organic to the both of us. Um, so the fun of this book, like the other ones there too, but in particular, this one with 
Dan was sort of listening to his love of, of Westerns and of horror and, and, you know, building the whole story from the ground up together and going back and forth and getting to change things and adjust and try and make it something that we both really loved. So it was, it was a real um, thrill. I mean, I'm, I'd love to work with Dan again anytime. So it was a blast. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. It was probably the, uh, you know, the most collaborative and easiest time I've ever had working with a writer. And um, so it was just a fun, fun project. We had a great time. Dan, I wanted to ask you in, in in terms of the artwork in it, um, was there anything in particular that you really like were excited about kind of getting to, to, to draw and showcase either in the old West or the horror elements? Well, I mean, yeah, certainly melding those two um, genres together and, and doing it in a way that was fresh, you know, um, you know, instantly when you're going to do a, a Western comic book, you're going to be compared to like, like the Mobius blueberry stuff. And I, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a go-to, but at the same time, you don't want to um, copy, copy that necessarily. And certainly, you know, this is, this is a horror story. It's more of a, even a horror story. It just happens to take place in the, in the West. So um, we started it out with like uh, bright colors and, and uh, oh, this is, you know, this is going to be uh, in this family or this genre. And then, uh, and then it progressively gets darker and darker. And um, it was interesting the way Scott fashioned the story because um, a lot of the um, flashbacks that Scott created, we landed up putting them in, or he, he you know, orchestrated and kind of, in a way, edited um, these flashbacks in, in different different parts. So it was kind of interesting to see, even from a standpoint of, you know, drawing it to see how, how the book would turn out eventually. Um, Got another funny thing I never mentioned to you, but I got a real kick out of this is because it was always a work in progress and Scott is always, and we had a lot of time in between things. Um, sometimes the names would change, like the character names. And yeah. um, I got, I just, it was just interesting. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So that's, you know, it, it was, it was fun in that way. But I'm, and I'm, I, I always like the, uh, the changes. They were, they were, I, I love how the book turned out. So the yeah, book has a lot too. of art for a uh, horror story. And I think with any story, you need that emotional heart factor. Like you have to really, you know, have a soft spot for for the people, the characters, rather. Yeah, if you don't care about the characters, you don't sometimes aren't going to not necessarily they have to be likable, but there has to be something you care about. Otherwise, you're not going to really care what what happens to them. Um, 100%. And mm -hmm. I I really like, you know, I really did like the character of. William Holt. Well, I guess it's Azriel yeah. William Holt. Um, Dan, you mentioned the flashbacks. That's one of the things that I thought came across so well in terms of the artwork. Uh, because when we first meet Holt in the first issue, he's been through some stuff. And then you don't know exactly what it is. And it's kind of revealed over a series of flashbacks. But when, when we see Holt in a flashback and it, it it's clear who it is, but there is such a lightness to how he's drawn in those flashbacks. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, he's happy and there's yeah. such a departure. For a little while he is. Well, for yeah. a little while, but it really, yeah. it really like cements that, that he's gone through some stuff when you think back to like that, those opening pages of that book and it, yeah. th those flashbacks work so well. Um, yeah, because he's so hardened later, like, yeah. you know, and, and Scott handles him in that kind of stoic sort of, you know, way that you want to see your hero. But he definitely he, now, now, thanks to all the cool flashbacks, you know exactly why he's so stoic and um, grim. Yeah, one of the things I really liked about Canary is, you know, I grew up, my grandfather loved Westerns. And like, so growing up, there was always a Western on, you know, from, you know. John Wayne, John Ford, Westerns to, you know, not as high quality productions that they were cranking out in like the 50s and 60s. And my he watched them all. And, you know, one of the, the tropes of that genre, you know, you see like the lone the lone guy, someone who is stoic standing up for the town or himself or whatever it might be, even if he's up against odds or overwhelming odds. I mean, um. But with Canary, where you you see that he's facing something is just there's 
there's nothing that that can kind of overcome what he's dealing with and being faced with something so so dark at times um you know it's just not something you really see and uh i really liked how the story kind of played out with holt what he dealt with in the beginning and then you know what he ends up dealing with like later on in the town and i don't know i felt kind of like a real uh not just it was like let's mash up western and horror but i felt kind of like a real parallel to kind of some of the big issues we're we're going through today um i don't know it's very just very interesting how i i kind of saw like what holt was dealing with with the town itself with you know the the mine of canary and i don't know like a bigger sense of some things we face today. I just found, just well, trying to draw some parallels there. Well, Scott, Scott, when he, when we first talked about it, that was paramount, wasn't it, Scott? I mean, yeah, you wanted to make it. That was your intention, correct? Yeah, very much. Here, let me just move this off the the thing. It's uh, I was charging it, but I'm like too old to sit like that for too long. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the whole goal. I mean, like. Doing a Western for me and and working with Dan, like when we first started talking about it, the fun was thinking of a Western as a way of kind of, you know, the best Westerns are always about who we are as a nation and like in our sort of imagination at that moment. And there are some that are really critical, like Outlaw Josie Wales or, you know, and then there are the searchers and there are others that are really heroic. But that genre itself is so you know, purely indigenous to here. And it's so much about how we think of ourselves that when we started talking about it, it was like, oh, this is going to be a Western, but it's going to have horror elements. The more we went into it, though, it was like, look, we really want it to be something that's about this this mine. And it's kind of a a classic ghost story about, you know, a mine that might still have these these, um, victims living in it. But it wasn't really about that so much as it was this town, even in its name, Canary, as this kind of warning about what what we might become and whether um, this mind sort of has has uh, uh, sort of a, is a premonition of the things that we really are sort of afraid of about ourselves, but writ large. And so it was a really interesting project kind of blending supernatural and making it something that felt almost like cosmic horror. And at the same time, trying to also keep it relevant. And I think, you know, Dan made a really good point at one point there was actually, and and I'm sorry, I like, I completely dropped the ball on this for the trade, but you know, I, I was very concerned about having the book have things in it or have a level of violence and a level of, um, sort of, uh, of disturbing sort of imagery that felt like it was uh, not typically found in Westerns, but that would, would, would sort of echo what we see today in all kinds of ways. And so in the initial drafts, the boy um, Apple who um, shoots, uh, kills the teacher in the inciting incident that kind of starts the, the whole story. And if you haven't read it yet, but you're watching this interview, essentially Canary is about, um, a series of really random murders that that are happening around this one area um, where people, children, old people are going sort of berserk and, and just killing bunches of people for no reason whatsoever. And it's about a U.S. marshal who's called in to investigate and and is about to retire and has had this really terrible experience in this area when he was younger with an outlaw who claimed to be something more than human because of the waters in this, in this region um, and is paired with a geologist who believes that there might be something um, in the, in the underwater, I'm sorry, in the underground sort of uh, aquifer uh, in this area that's causing people to go crazy. And what they find is something like much darker and more uh, and more disturbing on a supernatural level about this mine, that it's this nexus of, of evil, but, um, a place that is, you know, sort of also connects, exists almost out of time. And, and, uh, is this horror that's much bigger than, uh, like just sort of a, a haunted, you know, haunted cavern anyway, yeah. but, um, like elements of like the shining in this, even, I mean, there's all sorts of little callbacks and little Easter eggs, Scott, 
puts in there along the way. And it's one of those things, if you read it twice, you're like, oh, okay, this ties in here and this ties in there. It's probably a little maybe difficult at times for the comicsology readers to follow as much because um, the, the spacing of the books. But um, what's nice about this trade paperback coming out is you get to you know, read it like you would, say, a movie. Yeah, um, but there was even at the beginning, like the the, the boy that um, uh, oh, kills Apple. the teacher in the inciting incident, Apple. We changed it initially. He he sh- he shoots the teacher, um, and uh, I just at it, it, the last minute, you know, I really felt, and Comicsology felt, but I felt as well that it might be uh, like one one step too far, only because there was you know, things in the news constantly about school yeah, shooting. And still are, sadly. So. And, you know, Dan was braver than me about wanting to kind of put it in in the trade. And I think ultimately the the balance there, the thing that um, maybe speaks to the priorities of the book was uh, trying to really have it contain a level of kind of horror and, and violence and um, worry about who we're becoming that felt... Um, unsettling and disturbing yeah. while not pushing it over the edge into something that also might be salacious or that stuff. And I'm not really sure, you know, I, that's a hard balance to strike, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. but I love yeah. the book for what it's trying to do. And I'm so glad. I mean, it's gotten some of the best responses of anything that I've worked on um, in the creator owned space. So it's so nice to see uh, people responding to it in that way. Yeah, I I really liked how there were parts of it that I found, you know, um, it's somewhat challenging, not in terms of like the violence that's depicted or um, but more so in terms of what the book was, you know, trying to say or get across. Like, I, I just I love that Holt's father was a preacher, those types of elements that are that are woven in. I love how the p- page breaks are, you know, uh, the the one through six form and kind of how that ties into kind of like the underlying if mythology is the right word of the book. So all those little things that wanted me to like, you know, dig in a little bit more and like ask some more questions. I, I really love, that's the kind of stuff like I love when I can find something like that in a comic. So there were all these little nuggets of things that I could dig a little, a little deeper with, which I, uh, I really enjoyed about the story. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I loved it. Um, Thanks. I thought it was great. Um, Dan, one of the things I wanted to ask you, uh, because not, you know, we talked about Western and horror, but there are a lot of moments in this book that are just tense. And I think like tension is kind of difficult to do well in a comic book because it can be static. You know, it might be better achieved in like a film, but mm-hmm. you're able to do it, especially in a lot of close ups. There's one. I, I don't know if it's issue five or six. Um but in the, I guess, those later issues between, I think it's Mabel and Holt. And there's just like close-ups on their face. I think it's right before they're deciding like what to do after um, something happens in the town. And like the, 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 the tension is held so well in the, that, that paneling. And it really, I mean, the, the, the end of the book just kind of ratchets it up. But I really thought that you do that so well. And I mean, I, is that something you're conscious of in terms of like how do i make this as you know how do i focus in on the right thing to make it as tense as possible to really hold the reader's attention there well i i think it's just a matter of like building and where you place that camera and 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 when you go in close and when you when you're far enough away like how how close do you want the reader to be necessarily involved you know sometimes you feel you know, safer, further away. Sometimes, you know, even if it's a a top down shot, like maybe you're, you're safe up there. And it's a matter of, I don't know, I keep using the word safe, but, um, you know, especially in a horror, uh, film or or comic, you, you, you want to play with those safety issues. So, um, you know, the the typical comic book trope is to, to do a close up at times, but I think sometimes that gets maybe overused or used as a cheat and it, it should be done sparingly um but um you know scott gave me a lot of freedom which which i really appreciated but um you know his story was very you know he knew exactly what he wanted um you know out of 
out of certain scenes and scenarios going as far as to say, now let's maybe, um, you know, change angles on the, on the panels just to even further influence the fact that things are um, becoming very unsettling. And that's, that's a, that's an interesting trick even in film is when, when you have everything constantly centered and then you start deviating away from that um, in, in a slow, slow pattern from like a, a storyboard sense. Um, the person watching doesn't even necessarily know what's happening, but subconsciously, you know, things are, 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 are going askew. So um, it was nice that, you know, Scott seems to, you know, so much experience, you know, countless, countless books and titles and, you know, he knows how to tell a story, obviously. So, you know, not, not every writer is, is going to say, Hey, I want, I want, you know, let's, let's play with these elements. And, uh, he, you know, he knew exactly what he wanted. All right, let's take a quick break. Hey, comics fam. Indie comic book publisher Band of Bars just got a level up and announced it is now a cooperative. This heralds a new era for them, including a partnership with Dauntless Stories. And they added several new members to the ownership group. Marcus Jimenez is now chief operating officer. Brent Fisher takes on the role of chief diversity officer. And Joey Galvez is introduced as head of Kickstarter ops and social media manager, which is sure to increase their capabilities overall as a publisher. And it further promotes their mission statement of advancing representation, inclusion, and diversity in the media. They also established a new board of directors to help chart the new path of their journey. With new projects in the works like Alaska Goodbye dropping in June, Unbroken soon launching on Kickstarter, and Pond coming up with Dauntless, stay tuned to this space for more exciting news from the growing Bards family. Let's get back to the show. Scott, is that in, in terms of working with different artists, and you've worked with some artists, you know, multiple times throughout different books, and, you know, Someone like Dan, who you said you've come across, but this was your first time working on something like this. How do you figure out, like, do you just script everything the same way? Do you say, Dan, how do you, you know, do you have a conversation when you're starting out? Like, Dan, like, how, how do you like, like, what do you want me to do? Do you want full scripts? Do you want, you know, more room to play around with? Like, how, how do you get into that, you know, conversation? I mean, I figure with six issues, it's probably something that has to happen fast, but there's still a bit of a learning curve, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was the whole fun, you know, it was getting to getting to sort of talk to each other at the beginning and see how we like to work and and figuring it out together. Um, you know, I was at D.C. for for so long um, for me, I mean, just consistently for for 10 years plus with never really leaving for any period of time. Um, so being on Batman and then doing events like metal and death metal and justice league and all of that. Um, they're so constrained by, uh, you know, by the, the expectations and the demands of those characters. And, and I love that world. I mean, I adore it, but leaving there in 2020, um, and then having the, you know, the pandemic and all of this stuff, the, the exciting thing and the challenge was being able to say, no matter what, I'm just going to make books with these people who I find really inspiring. Some of whom I've worked with before, but not in this capacity. Some of whom I've never worked with, but wanted to and figure out books that are organically ours together. And sometimes that meant experimenting a little as we went. And sometimes it, you know, some co-creators really liked having an extremely firm, um, <laughs> extremely firm plan page to page in all kinds of ways. But for me, the joy was being able to kind of, be a little looser and create together. Um, and no, like I always knew the ending of the book. I always knew, you know, the basic, the basic bones of it, but being able to feel it out together and be like, which parts are, you know, uh, is Dan responding the most to which parts working together, feel like they have the most energy expanding those sort of using, relying on other things that feel like we didn't see before, but then like Dan would draw something and then it would give me an idea, even the, the way he drew the mask, I just loved so much, like the upside down coffin and more of the stuff about um, Holt's father and, and this kind of this strange sort of past that he had, this kind of religious background came out as the book was going. And so things like that just sort of were wonderful discoveries along the way. It was part of the fun of the process. 
but it was always starts with, and I'd recommend this to like any aspiring writer listening to this. Uh, it took me a while to understand this a couple of years, at least like getting into the industry, but um, talking to your co-creator or the artist you're working with, trying to find a sweet spot where you're both um, or where you as a writer are giving as much as you can to the artist to be able to allow them to shine. It'll work a lot better for you, you know, rather than just writing in a very strict fashion that, that only works for you. Um, I, I have friends who are very big writers who still, who do that and it works, you know, they, they can only really write one way. But for me, part of the fun is trying to be adaptable and, and, and making something that feels kind of organically, um, or just alive and, and made together as you go in some way. When you're working with, how, how different is it when you're working with, say, Jock or uh, Greg Capullo? Is it, it is there a variation in how you deliver the the, the scripts or plots? Yeah, or? yeah, there there is. Like, um, those two are more, like, Greg, Greg in particular likes, like, the absolute least amount possible. So mm -hmm. sometimes with Greg, like, I'll write the script more in terms of what I need so I can sort of feel it out and live in it and then undo that and then write something that's like a third of that, you know? And, and it took me a long time to be able to, to operate that way um, comfortably. But my, our compromise was like, I would get on the phone and kind of walk him through the way I saw the story mm -hmm. or the issue and then sort of be like, but you do whatever you want and here are the basic beats. And, mm -hmm. um, he would, uh, and our relationship really evolved that way. Whereas um, Jock is similar to the way we work together, where it was sort of a hybrid, you know, where mm -hmm. it was a lot of um, the dialogue isn't in there, but it's described as to what it'll yeah. be. And um, I know exactly. Yeah. I always knew exactly what the, uh, that was, was interesting for me because I always knew basically what everyone's saying in every panel, because Scott would describe the, the beats and so you, you have to hit those beats and, you know, occasionally there's an extra panel um, to, to hit a certain beat, but it would be very, uh, I was just, you know, kind of excited to see how it would actually be scripted, scripted, because, you know, sometimes there's, there was scripting and sometimes it was more like he's, this is, he's angry about this or it, this, it's this person's agenda here and they're manipulating that person and what have you. But it was, I found that very interesting, you know. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's the these last few years have been honestly, I think the most inspiring for me of my career, getting to work with some people who I was really familiar with, like Greg on We Have Demons, and then some people I had never worked with um, extensively before, like Dan and Lisa Tula Lote, and each book was its own experience that way, you know, and it was. Um, it was just a real joy and I've, I've loved this period. You know, I feel like, um, I got to grow so much learning from them as a, as a writer that it was, it has been like, yeah, probably also the happiest period, you know, it's been so creatively exciting to just make yeah. stuff together yeah. and have, have good partners also like very grateful to comiXology and dark horse yeah. and other places that have been supportive of me the last few years and my partners, but it's been great, you know, just yeah, comicsology put a lot of love into all the books and um, the presentation that that comic book convention, um, you know, brought so much light and attention to all the series. Uh, would, would, would they would we you land up calling it Scott? What was it? Scott Scott Tober? Oh, yeah, they did that. <laughs> yeah, Scott Tober. <laughs> Scott Tober. I love Scott it. Tober again. Yeah. And in, in July, which was funny, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were very supportive, you know, yeah. and then they're, it, it's been, it was great. You know, they just, they were up for anything. And it, I, I mean, my, again, my goal was to be able to just try things that I hadn't before. So to be able to maybe work with some artists that I, you know, never gotten to collaborate with or try a genre I hadn't like romance, the uh, historical Romance. romance like barnstormers or yeah. all ages you know like with jamal with dudley dotson it's totally out of my wheelhouse like we were like let's write a book for our kids and so mm -hmm. it was a real creative walkabout you know and, and it was just a, a real joy i'm very grateful to have gotten to do it i enjoyed harassing jamal that's san diego that was a lot of fun <laughs> for me 
Jamal's oh, great. Yeah, well, that's no, the other he's, thing he's, too. He's a great guy. Like, good, good sense of humor. You know, like, they, yeah. everybody. I mean, that's the other thing is like, there's not. I mean, everybody here is somebody that I really like. You know, as as a person and want to spend time with. So, I think my biggest regret or the biggest issue over the last few years was just the the um, the witches' writers' room came along. I didn't know that it would be that that show would get greenlit. Um, it's the first thing I've ever had, like, you know, actually wind up on TV. Um, and it was, you never know where that lands or how it, how it was going to happen. And, and, um, it's, it, show I'm, at, too? Scott? I'm show running it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm co-show it's running it. With responsibility. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that the, the biggest issue I had was more, I've had is more, um, wow. having one foot in animation while, uh, trying to really, um, you know, give my everything to, to the, to the books. And I feel really proud and confident of the quality of the, the books that never, never, um, you know, worry about that. But the thing I regret is more like, I wish I had gotten to spend more time with each creator just socially and getting to know, like, I, I was very, you know, I, I wish I had more time to hang out with Dan and get to know Dan and, and, go to cons and talk more and all of that stuff too, which we, we did get to do, but I think that was the part that for me um, got a bit swallowed up over the last few years by, by TV stuff, which, you know, is, is, um, I feel not really slow down either. Scott. I don't see that <laughs> no. slowing down for you, you know? No, no, I have, I no, but I mean, like I, I'm going to survive. I'll make it. I'm going to make it I, I, like, I think the, the, um, I've pared back a lot, you know, so I have a lot less, a lot less, um, on my plate the coming year, but, uh, I think, I think I do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I love all the stuff, you know, too. And like, they just, you know what I mean? Like, I love, I love the books and I love the project. So, you know, and I, I really, I would put the books of the last couple of years up against anything I've ever done, you know, with, we were lucky enough to get some accolades for them and stuff, but just beyond all of that, you know, beyond the critical reception, I, I'm so proud of them, you know, Canary, I would put up against anything I've ever done in my whole life, you know, and, and that's a testament to Dan's work, you know, hugely, but, um, that's, that was the experience with these books and Canary being like, to me, a superlative example of that just something that i never would have gotten to make couldn't have made this way without a partner like dan and just making something that only the two of us could do as a team and really surprising me and uh and loving it so like yeah. likewise i mean that was it's, it's kind of a you know once in career sort of uh move like that to work with someone like scott because i admired his work you know i i bought I, I very rarely will buy comics and to, you know, to buy his first works and everything. Um, I didn't, I didn't get human torch though. Sorry, Scott. That wasn't <laughs> yeah. That's Snyder. you should say that was funny. Cause today was the, like the birthday of the yeah. human torch. And uh, that was my very first comic that I ever had published was um, a one shot for timely, the revival of timely comics at Marvel. I still get like a penny in royalties now and then. It's like, uh, and I was Janine Schaefer and it was Scott Wagner who did Atomic Robo and he gave me, I have a page here, but I'd never written for comics before. And so I was just like, my script for like an eight, for a 20 page thing was like 50 pages long. Or it was like, and then this and then this. And then, and Scott had to be like, that's not how we do this exactly. You know, he was such a wonderful, he was so wonderful. And like, I, of course I, you know, I changed it, but yes, that was, that was today. That was today was uh yeah, i saw that today was I, was like, yeah. I, I wasn't That's aware of your work until like um the vampire stuff american vampire so but i remember seeing that and, and reading it and going oh this is so edgy and um i don't know it just it felt like okay this is kind of where comics are going and it was exciting very exciting stuff thanks man well same i mean again i'm i'm really eager to work together again and i feel like yeah just have the we have the second season of the writers room stuff this summer 
and then in the fall into the winter things really I, I get to get back to, to comics um in a bigger way you know that's so, exciting well keep yeah. me in yeah. mind scott keep me in mind <laughs> no I, I would i there's i i like I, I there's no way to have had a better experience and again like i feel like you're also one of the not unsung heroes because people really love you but i honestly feel you're um you're not given the credit you deserve enough for um the consistent quality the growth in your work all of it like just i think you're Thanks. somebody who deserves a lot more attention than you get sometimes in the industry that way so my hope is that I don't know. My hope is this award season people will will um will notice the book for you, not for me, but oh, for you. I appreciate I, that. Let's see. Yeah, I, I mean I agree. Uh not just the art the, you know, in, in terms of the penciling, uh, but the coloring in Canary is uh, un unbelievable. Unbelievable, um, yeah. And I mean you Dan, yeah. you're coloring your own your own work. And I mean just from the yellows to the oranges to like then the deep blue, like the color palette kind of changes with the issues at times. And um, yeah, I just love the color work in it. Oh, uh, yeah. I, that I think was a big was, component. Yeah, there's less and less yeah. ink on the pages these days. It's more, more color. Color is very, it's, it's tough. I, I spent more time coloring than, than uh, drawing half the time. So um that it started out, that was kind of a funny story. I, I, I had in my mind, I wanted, it to kind of look in the beginning, at least like the wild, wild west intro, like that title sequence from the TV show. Um, oh, okay. not, not the Will Smith movie, um, right. but the TV <laughs> show. And so I, I had just this idea of how that kind of looked and, um, but I never bothered to actually find out what it looked like until we were maybe a full issue in. And I was like, you know, that's gotta be somewhere on, on YouTube. Someone's probably uploaded that and they had, and I looked at it and it is nothing like that at all. Like I had just imagined all sorts of like painterly, you know, skies and all this, these, these kind of Bob Peak, um, uh, you know, in, inspired like wild brush strokes. And none of that is in that title sequence. But sometimes that's why your like memory of like an old West or a, a Batman movie or even sometimes a comic book, like how you remember it or how it made you felt is um, better than what, what it might have really been. Yeah, that's it is funny how really, thanks. Thanks, Scott. It is thank you. It is funny how that happens. Um Scott, you mentioned witches and and the writers room for season one, and then you said you're rolling right into because season two's already been greenlit. And um oh, which is the writing of it, yeah. So I'm excited. Oh. So they greenlit us for a second season for the production of it. So technically they could do it and then say we don't want to put it on TV, but it's I mean, I would, I would be, there be surprised if that happens at this stage, unless we really yeah. bomb or whatever. But um, yeah, so we have a second season uh, this summer. <laughs> so well, well, fingers crossed that, yeah. that 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 works out. But I wanted to to say, um, witches. I love witches. I mean, it's one of my witches. top comic books. Um, witches. I think I want to say issue one came out in like October of like 2014. Somewhere around um, there, yeah, 2014, yeah. 2015. Yeah. So my my oldest is 11, so she was two when Witches first came out, and <laughs> um, uh, that book fucked me up. <laughs> I was like a new time dad. Like I, it, it it felt like it was, and I heard you talk about this a little bit in interviews, but it really felt like it was channeling like all the anxieties I felt I had about being a dad in that book. Um, there were, there were two books that really did it. Uh, Witches number one and, and walking dead 100, like mm. really um, had a profound impact on me. And it, it was interesting reading Canary now and trying to see, like, think like, wow, they're like 10 years apart. And the same guy that wrote, you know, witches wrote Canary and, um, I don't know. I was maybe trying to connect some dots that I, I can't connect yet, but I, um, I don't know. Scott, I has just, some, I, I, Scott has some parenting skills, so he's definitely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Unless we're like, I kind of write the way I go. Like I'll, it's weird because I feel like sometimes if you look at the books that I'm working on in a period, they, they're all sort of 
they're all kind of working a theme in some way. So death of the family on Batman was the same time as witches. And that's very much also about parenthood, weirdly, where Joker is saying to Batman, you don't really want a family stopping you from being the best work version of yourself that you could be. And um, that was when we were pregnant with our second kid that that story was being sort of uh, created. So you try and go for the jugular, your own jugular, you know, and be like, what is the thing I'm most afraid of right now? And with Canary and this period, um, I have wrote a couple books like this. There's another one, uh, Book of Evil. It's like a very different book, but it's part of the same line. Uh, it's a future where like, 92% of the population are born psychopaths um, and no one knows why. And it takes place like 25 years after this and it's with Jock, but it's mostly prose, um, which was its own challenge. But th these, those two books and a couple other things explore this theme of like, I think th the worry that what makes us special as a country um, or some of the things that make us really special also um, make us really can make us really scary at times or the potential to become something really scary is there. And so that, um, you know, and, and the world we're leaving our children, all of that kind of stuff is, is kind of in my, in my mind, you know, writing these, especially in 2020, you know, when, when a lot of this stuff was going on, um, a lot of the, the, um, between the pandemic and sort of political upheaval and everything was just like, so, um, Canary for me is really about that. It's this, it's this group of people who really believe um, this kind of cabal of, of wealthy robber barons who go around the world finding these, these spots that they believe there's this geological phenomenon where there's almost like an absence or a hole in the earth. Um, but that hole is connected to this kind of strange cosmic, um, this strange cosmic um, chemistry that will mutate and evolve and change the things that touch it. And if water or anything goes through it, it will start to um, alter the, the biology of anything that comes into contact with it. And they think that this is holy. They think that this is, this is almost like God fallen to earth or to them sort of the myth of Lucifer is someone that falls from heaven and breaks into pieces. And those pieces are void and those voids fall all across the earth like mouths, like hungry mouths, and those things land. And if you can find one and embrace it, sort of and kiss that thing, go into it in that way, you'll emerge as something reborn. And so America holds one of these. And, um, and it kind of also appears, it appears and becomes active and then disappears at times based on this strange kind of cosmic orbit. So um, it comes every kind of once every hundred and something years, it, it activates or it becomes kind of energized. Uh, and so it's very much about like a thing that's a supernatural, horrible thing. It's like a scary hole in the ground that turns us into monsters. But what the book is about, because it's a Western too, is like we were saying earlier is, you know, this fear that um, these people that uh, believe that believe that we're special because we have the capacity to turn into something monstrous. And so that, that and that we're supposed to sort of rise up and become this horrible version of ourselves, as opposed to some of the things that Holt recognizes make us really special in a different way, you know, and some of the things that we hold really dear in our principles that maybe make us the opposite of that. And so it's supposed to be this battle of good and evil that really is about different strains of what makes us make us who we are, you know, in, in primal ways, I think, as a as a country, things that I think are incredibly admirable. You know, this weird democratic experiment where we're all in it together and we decide we're all equal. And then this other thing, which is, you know, this total rampant, you know, selfishness and the ability to step on other in that. And that's what these people see is like, see, we're special. Right. We should be this conquering crazy thing. And so anyway, not to ramble, but that's. But we that's like rambling here. This it's book. fine. Yeah, that's 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 what this book is thinking about in that way. It was it was really fun to get to blend those things in ways that felt like, you know, uh, hadn't tried or hadn't seen anywhere else yet. Yeah. That, well, I, I think it works. I think it all works. And a, a lot of that also is to Dan's, uh, credit because, oh, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a fantastic looking book and I, 
mean, I love Dan's artwork. Um, you know, uh, was glad to see when he had this, uh, his art book on, on Zoop, I think last yeah. year was, was fantastic. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it really mm-hmm. works. And I hope folks check it out. Uh, so it's going to be out the whole trade, June 26th. Uh, so when you're listening to this podcast, make sure you let your local comic shop know so you can get a copy of the trade. Because it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Westerns, like I said before, and love the horror genre. And I love to see the, the two of these mashed up in, in, in such a way. Um, yeah, and Dark, uh, Dark Horse does a great job of, uh, I can't wait to see what it actually looks like from a design standpoint. And I'm sure it's going to be an amazing uh, trade paperback. Yeah, Dark Horse has just been doing, they put out fantastic stuff. I love so many of their books. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be great. So um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of Westerns, I'm always curious. Do you have a favorite Western, both of you? Oh, man. I mean, I, I could name a ton, but Butch Cassidy yeah. and the Sundance Kid is probably I saw that with my dad on TV. And I'm, Paul Newman is like my favorite of all time on every level. But, yeah. you know, uh, that and the Searchers and the Unforgiven and the Outlawed, I mean, and Outlawed Josie Wells. And then there are modern ones, too. Like, I really loved uh, Bone Tomahawk and mm-hmm. um, Hell or High Water is sort of a modern mm-hmm. Western, too. Yeah. But, yeah, I like Hell or yeah. High Water. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there those are my favorites are probably those that you know I don't know if there's any one that you wouldn't know off of a list of, you know, That's the classics, the good, the bad, and the ugly and all those. So Yeah. Yeah, like you, um, I, mean, I would say Shane was like probably the first Western I fell in love with. Oh yeah. Um, with Alan Ladd and um then uh Probably Pale Rider, I really like too. I mean, uh, all those Pale plenty of awesome. westerns were, were great. Um, Unforgiven, that was, you know, probably just almost a flawless western. So, mm-hmm. but there's so many good ones. Um, there's, That's there's why I feel like westerns. it's a genre that we should do more of these days. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? I know it's hard to do because it's also historically, in a real way, it gets more, it, it's probably more uncomfortable in all kinds for all kinds of reasons. Oh yeah. So many reasons. But that said, like it has this power too of like being so American, you know, it's so it, it's the mythology to, of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to think about like, you know, as you as you get older and everything and, and have have a family and recognize um generational experiences. And when you go back and think about when this Wild West period actually took place, it's not too many generations ago. Like, um, you know, the, the, um, the East coast is, was fairly civilized and it wasn't too long ago when, when the West really wasn't. And, uh, you can see that in some of the buildings. You know, I live in California now. I used to live back East, but an old building out here is 200 years old, you know, and, and, you know, in New York, that's nothing, you know, it's crazy. Um, uh, yeah. like a hundred year old building here is like oh, revered and they put a plaque on it. It's, it's crazy. Um, and so just the lawlessness and, and, and the relatively short time of period that, that took place, you know, is it, it's not too, too far past our current history. And yet it, it seems almost like a mythology. So that that's what kind of, you know, what makes, I think the Western genre so unique and special because it, it, it seems like, Oh, that, that was, you know, could be the 1400s, you know, it, no, it was, it was really about, you know, a hundred years ago or a little over a hundred years ago. It's not that long. Yeah. Your great grandfather could have been in the wild west. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that's true. It, it's not as, it's not as long ago as, as, as we think it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, I hope everyone goes and picks it up. I absolutely loved it. I was glad I got to read it. Um, I'll probably also pick up the trade just because I like to have those things in 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 my hand, even though I got to read it digitally. Um, <laughs> Thanks, I mean, before we before we go, I just want to wrap everything up. I uh, I mean, I if, if there's anything else you want to you highlight or that you have coming out. I mean, Scott, I know you have your newsletter and the uh, your your class is still going on. Um, yeah, and I think. If you haven't, if anyone hasn't read Barnstormers, you should. Um, but I know you have a couple other series that are that are coming out right now as well. And I, Dan, if there's anything that I, I, you want to talk about, 
Oh, no, I was going to say um, the, the, your new one that's coming out, Scott, with um, Francis. Yeah, with uh, Francesco, Francesco, who yeah, is like a, a familiar face. And uh, Francesco and I really like to do classic horror. Like he's a huge Universal monster fan, and so am I. And going all the way back to like, you know, 1930s, 1920s, all the way to now horror, we both love it. Um, so what we try and do is like create something that feels like a classic horror story and then sort of make to do a, a kind of modern take on, on it. So it has elements of both. So white boats very much in that vein where it's kind of like the Island of Dr. Moreau or, um, something like that, you know, an HG Wells or a Jules Verne kind of story that, but updated to be, <laughs> to be about like scary rich people on an island now. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I really, I really enjoy it, but I mean, I'd love to keep the focus for me on, um, I really hope that, that anyone listening to this will, will go pick up Canary. Cause again, I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of all the stuff that I've worked on, but Canary is up there with the things that like, like I, I really, uh, I would put up with the best stuff I've ever been a part of easily. So I'm, deeply deeply grateful to dan and to you know um Thomas LG and dark horse but to dan in particular for for building this thing together because i love it so i hope people will go out there and and think about it in june thanks scott yeah, yeah. i'm gonna blush over here <laughs> <laughs> no and i'm gonna i'm gonna hit you up we're gonna I, i'm like whenever you're free and come the fall like whenever you're free um i want to i want to do a lot more together i'd love to work together again uh, likewise and this yeah, time we'll get to like hang out more and party more that's what i mean like it wasn't even like that i didn't have time to really the books again like i'm the work was never an issue about getting to really put everything into the books but it was i i in my mind i had more i like i just i wish i'd had more time to genuinely just socialize with dan because we, yeah. we get along and i love i love hanging out with you so that's 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 my big regret about it, it was more like you know um not getting more of a chance to actually enjoy working together in a social way while we were doing it. Yeah, it was kind of also a little bit overlapping with the pandemic quite a bit. So maybe the second time around, it'll be a different story. That's true. But it was a real highlight getting to come see you and um, in your place and all that. And oh, yeah, it was and, nice. Uh, to, yeah, it was kind of a was interesting. Class. I forget it was a party during a convention that we had Frank yes. Thierry over and, um, Bunch of friends. That was kind of nice. That was the low Yeah, that, that, that was everything a whole different direction, but uh, a lot of drinking, maybe too much at that point with Frank. But uh, no, all, it was like getting to meet your, your wonderful yeah. family and and all of that. It was it was a real pleasure. So, and I think I had my kid too. I had yeah, my kid with did. me. Yeah, you played with your. It was really fun. Yeah, it was when I was with Emmett. That's right in California, mm -hmm. and uh, I was with my um. 11 year olds. Cause it was a fun, we were taking a father son trip out there um, and doing a quick convention, but um, I promised them I'd take him out there and take him to like a uh, baseball Disney to World Dodger World. stadium and all that stuff. So oh, was, nice. yeah, he's a huge baseball fan, like beyond huge baseball fan. So yeah, I think he was wearing some baseball stuff when he came over. He's one of those kids that like um, my two sons are like so different. Three sons. I mean, I have, the third one is five, but like as of yesterday, actually, but, um, he, uh, the 17 year old is like just super happy go lucky worries about nothing is like, like handsome, handsome and popular. And I totally don't relate to it at all. <laughs> I'm like, I was always like a ball of nerves. And then my 11 year old is just like that <laughs> where he's like, you know, worries about everything and all of that. And then also, um, He's the kind of kid that like loves one thing for a period of time and consumes that thing on every level. And baseball, it used to be, you know, when he was little, it was Star Wars and Pokemon and all that. And now baseball has been it for like ha happily for the last three or four years where he's, he's he stayed with it. But he knows like, I mean, he, he knows everything, like every stat. And so I followed him down that rabbit hole and it's been like a real joy. We have like partial season tickets to the Yankees here and oh, I just wow. bothered Frank oh, actually I was just trying to get Frank to go with me tomorrow but he can't go no yeah so no. <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway that's my yeah he's 
he's uh but that was fun yeah he it was a lot of fun coming out there and seeing you yeah well i i hope you two get to work together again only because i'll 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 enjoy reading it and uh i I hope you get more hanging out time (laughs) yeah me too jimmy thank you dude you guys do such a great job with these i really appreciate it it's a pleasure to get to be a part of it no i thank you both for being on this i i think i was telling dan before before you 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 joined us that um yeah, I, I I just like doing this. And Byron O'Neill is the other host, and we we don't host it together. It's we just like handle our own episodes. But Byron wanted to start a podcast, and um, I said, yeah, I'll I, I'll I'll talk to people. And um, yeah, it's been two years. Uh, I've done over a hundred of my own episodes, and um, gotten to talk to a lot of fun creators. So it's been um, it's been really great. That's and really especially with folks I'm a, a fan of, and I've read a bunch of their stuff. It's just you know. Um, it's just a joy to kind of listen to the two of you talk about comics. So thank oh, you. Yeah, I could talk to on. Dan. I could talk to Dan for at least like another. We could go for. I was like, wait, this is over already. I could easily do more, <laughs> but I appreciate it. And I know it's late, also. So we got to do it again. That's what yeah. we have to do. Just do it again. Yeah, the two of you, you're welcome uh, to come back anytime. But um, yeah, thank you, Scott and Dan. Thank you very much, uh, listeners. June 26th, Canary, the trade paperback, Western horror. It's got a little bit of cosmic horror as well. You're, you're, you're going to love it. Absolutely love it. Make sure you get it. Uh, also, shout out to my brother, uh, Bobby. He's the Cryptid Creator Corner's number one most dedicated fan. I, I shout him out every episode because Bobby listens to all my episodes. He's the only, and uh, he buys a lot of comics, too. We go to Baltimore Comic Con together every year. And I always, I started this bit like a couple episodes. I don't know how many episodes ago and I've, like, I keep doing it. So, so shout out Bobby and uh, thank you listeners. Please pick up Canary and uh, let me know if you like it. Cause I, I, I want to talk about it now and um, thanks God and Dan. Thank I'll you. see you next time. Thank you guys and so I much. Did. Thanks everybody. It's great seeing you, yeah. Scott. Thanks. Thanks Jimmy. For all the kind too, words. Gonna, we got to catch up really soon. All right. All right. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Joey Calvez. I want to tell you guys a little bit about the Department of Metahuman Affairs. This one is a story about a team led by a retired sidekick, two felons, a failed actor from Broadway, and a reprogrammed cyborg. But their first mission is to stop the criminals who have robbed a bank, and they will have to set the world at ease. You're going to get 180 pages of entertainment action-packed awesomeness right here in the first six issues in a collected hardcover volume one all you got to do is head on over to kickstarter.com and type in the department of metahuman affairs or dma and check it out right now